Okay, very well. I guess we can start. We are a couple of minutes late. So um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Silvia Serfati today uh, from Coulomb Institute. And uh, she will speak about mean field limits for Coulomb type dynamics. And uh, if you have missed the wonderful other lecture that she already gave, this is an occasion for uh, making it up. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> Thank you, Camilo. So, uh... Fortunately, it's not going to be exactly the same lecture at the Adler lecture, so that would be a bit of a, of a the variety. And um, it, it does start from the same premise, though, which is uh, interesting points that uh, interact with Coulomb interactions or in uh, vortices in superconductors and superfluids and both Einstein condensates. Uh, and the question is to derive effective dynamics when there are many such points or vortices. And, and so initially, actually, I started to work on this in the context of um, Gins-Borlando equations and gross pitayevsky equations, which means the models from condensed matter physics. And then um, I sort of realized you, if you can do harder, you can do <laughs> easier. Uh, you can also do these discrete problems. Um, and it's sort of a nicer setup to, to describe. So I will start with the discrete setup and towards the end of the talk, I'll show you um, how the, the same uh, sort of idea came about originally in, in this context of uh, models from condensed matter physics. But okay, but so it, it's, it's really more of an analysis talk, which is, it's an analysis seminar, so uh, hopefully that's adapted. Uh, so we want to consider a system of ODEs uh, corresponding to uh, particles which interact with this type of interaction. So sum of W of Xi minus Xj, so just a pair, pair potential, which is uh, completely radial, symmetric, everything you want. In fact, more specifically, I consider uh, minus log of the distance in dimensions one or two, so that's the log case, or um, inverse powers of the distance, that would be the risk case. But the power here S has to be between D minus two and D. And you observe that D minus two corresponds to the Coulomb situation. And so this is a sort of super Coulomb uh, interaction. So something that's at least as singular as Coulomb. And it's always repulsive. All the particles have the same sign, plus one, same charge, etc. So what uh, are we interested about? In, uh, so either we want to consider a gradient flow, the velocity of each particle is given by the, uh, the opposite of the gradient of the energy um, of all the particles. And here it's a mean field uh, scaling because you divide by N. So it's the average uh, force, if you want, generated by the other particles that matters and you may be able here in the case of the gradient flow to add possibly uh, some smooth uh, force, a little V here if you want. So this is just for a bit of generality, but you don't have to think about it. Uh, then the second example is a conservative flow, uh, some sort of Hamiltonian uh, flow if, if you want, which uh, you have an anti-symmetric operator here that's applied to the gradient. Uh, and this is particularly relevant, uh, an example that's famous, <coughs> the point vortex system in 2D, right? So if you, if you take a log in 2D, the points are your vortices, the point vortices, then, then J uh, just to be the rotation by pi over two, it's anti-symmetric and that's just the point vortex system. And then you have Newton's law where the acceleration is equal to the average force. Okay, now if you want, you can add to this some diffusion, some noise with a theta temperature and WIT, some independent Brownian motions. And I'll discuss that a bit later. Okay, so now if you backtrack a little bit, start from a general question like this. If you have Xi dot equals an average force like this with a force kernel K, possibly with noise. Um, what are the questions you want to ask? Well, what is the limit of the empirical measure of the particles, right? So if xit are the particles at uh, location of particles at time t, you form the empirical measure. And you ask whether that converges to some mu t, uh, solving ho hopefully some, some sort of PD. Hmm? Is there a problem with sound or something? 
No? Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So yeah, we heard you yes, well. We can, we can we, hear you. We also heard whatever it was, but it's gone. Okay. Yes, some people forgot to mute themselves, but I did it as a host. If, yeah. I hope nobody gets offended by that. No, no, I just I was just was wondering if someone was commenting on the fact they couldn't hear me or something. All right, so another point of view is the uh, sort of probabilistic point of view of this, where you would set, uh, you would give yourself a density uh, on configuration space, right, Fn0 at initial time, and you ask how this evolves in time. So there's notion of propagation of chaos, which is uh, if initially your uh, density is uh, tensorized in tensorized form. Uh, so if you want, if initially your particles are independent, with some law mu naught x1, et cetera, mu naught xn. Is it true that um, at later times, the probability density remains in this uh, sort of tensorized form for some uh, appropriate mu t? Uh, and of course, in what sense would you make this approximation where you would have to fix k and look at the k first marginals of fn? Uh, so if such a thing holds true, then you have what's called propagation of chaos. And it turns out that more or less, these two notions of convergence are, are equivalent. So if you can prove a conversion of empirical measures, you get a, a propagation of chaos. Yeah. So I did a little check for you in the case of the first marginal. But uh, after that, the combinatorics gets a little harder. But it's, it's a it's sort of classical facts. OK, so now what is the equation we expect in the end? We can uh, formally derive it by uh, using this sort of easy identity on uh, uh, Dirac masses, uh, time derivatives of Dirac's. Or if you want, we can look at the, at the equation satisfies by Fn and see that it solves some, uh, some form of what's called Uville equation, which is some equation of this form. And you can write the PBGKY hierarchy, which is you, you can write an equation that relates F and K to the later to the other FNKs, in fact. And imagining that this converges to some tensorized form, you can formally uh, see what equation would have to be satisfied by the uh, mu t, which is here, just the limit of the empirical measure. So that's my mean field limit equation. And so, as I said, based on this, and if you unplug the fact that xi dot is given by this law, uh, you expect that dt mu is divergence of k convolved with mu times mu. And if you have some added diffusion, then you pick up an, uh, an extra additive uh, Laplacian of mu here multiplied by temperature. Okay, so it's just saying that the density of particles is being sort of pushed, transported by uh, the velocity, which is the average force generated by this density itself plus possibly some diffusion. Yeah. Now, if you're interested in Newton's law, the second order um, OD system, then you should rather look at the kinetic formulation of the problem. And so you should look at an equation satisfied by a rho, which is the density of particles having position x and velocity v. And that will naturally solve a Vlasov type equation. So dt rho plus v dot grad rho, that's the transport operator, plus the uh, force term dot grad v rho plus possibly the diffusion. And mu is then the marginal um, of rho uh, in the x variable. Okay, so now how do you prove a convergence of the endpoint system as n goes to infinity to these types of uh, um, solutions to PDEs, well, a classical method uh, that dates back some, some decades ago is uh, you can get a proof without too much effort. For example, by comparing trajectories, you look at the trajectories of the true points and you look at the trajectories of fictitious points that would be following the characteristics of the limiting equation and show that if these are initially close, they remain close by some sort of Grandval argument, for example. And that works well when the force kernel is Lipschitz. So this K is Lipschitz. All right, now we're dealing uh, in this case that I discussed with the very non-Lipschitz um, kernels, non-regular because they all have this singularity at the origin. 
Uh, and so people have tried instead to control the minimal distance that can be achieved between points uh, in order to control these types of uh, singularities. So in particular works of Auré and Jabin. And that works okay, but in cases that are um, subcoulombic typically. So you cannot reach the Coulomb singularity with this type of approach. Another um, line of thought is to find a good metric that uh, can metrize the distance between uh, trajectories, you know, between empirical measures. So how do you measure distance between empirical measures? Well, Wasserstein distances are quite appropriate. And you want to prove that if you have two uh, solutions to your mean field uh, uh, equation, your limit equation, for example, you have a uniqueness principle, right? In, in the form of a, of a sort of ground value relation between the, on the distance between these two solutions. And now if you're lucky enough, uh, this thing is, uh, you, can, you can input here, not a true solution to the mean field evolution, but your empirical measure mu and t, which solves the discrete problem and, uh, and, and still write the same inequality. And that allows you to show that you actually remain close to your expected uh, limit. Okay. And, Another uh, line of thought is to use a relative entropy method. So uh, you think in terms of those densities on configuration space, and you look at the relative entropy between Fn and the tensorized uh, version of your uh, expected limiting uh, thing. So here I put rho, it could be called mu in this case. So it's, uh, this is how you should normalize the, the relative entropy. Of course, it's a, it's a kind of distance, not quite a distance, but it's a good object to measure closeness. And again, you try to show the, that uh, as you differentiate it in time, it, get, it, get, it can be controlled by itself. So this is what Jabin Wang did uh, in a recent paper. And it works also for K that's a bit irregular, but not too irregular. So to tell you, to give you an idea, they assume W minus one infinity. So K is the derivative of a bounded function. Right, typically. Uh, so still doesn't quite work to treat Coulomb. But okay, we'll see these ideas coming back. All right, so now I specialize to my uh, particular kernel W, uh, Coulomb or Reese, and these are the equations I want to obtain. Uh, I, I let go of the noise for now. So one is here a mean field dissipative, and one is mean field conservative. So I'm only talking about the first order equations there, or if you want second order, it would be Vlasov Poisson and Poisson if the kernel is, is Coulomb and otherwise you could call it Vlasov Ruiz. Okay, everyone is with me up to now? Yes. All right, so let me uh, tell you a bit what was known in, on this kind of singularity. So as I said, the point vortex system has been quite studied and is a particular instance of this. If you take the 2D log, interaction case, and then you, it's known that it converges to uh, 2D incompressible Euler in vorticity form. So famous results of uh, Goodman, Howe, Lowen, Brog, and Chochet. And if you add noise, then you converge instead to 2D Navier-Stokes in vorticity form. That's been proved and it works, okay, because the log in 2D is singular, but it's barely singular. So you can work with it. Uh, the proof that's there would not extend to 3D, for instance. Um, as I said, there's been work on the sub Coulomb case. So that's, that's the case S strictly less than D minus two using an idea of Wasserstein distance uh, to, to metrize the, the distance to the limit. And here they use uh, infinity Wasserstein. Uh, so these papers of Ore and collaborators. Then there's work in 1D, and in 1D things are a bit special because all the interactions that I discussed are convex in 1D, which they are not in higher D, uh, and you can exploit that. And uh, again, with the Wasserstein gradient flow idea, you are able to make it work. Uh, and then there was uh, this paper by, um, uh, he was my former student, Mitya Durax, where he first uh, applied this modulated energy method that I'm going to describe that I had introduced for Gins-Borlando context 
and was first applied by him in this uh, RIS context, and it worked at first in low dimension, you see uh, d less than two and s tricky less than one. Okay, now when it comes to the convergence to Vlasov Poisson, the second order equations with the kinetic formulation, etc., again, things are stuck below Coulomb. So s strictly less than d minus two. Uh, and it was proved by a relative entropy method. So I mentioned a bit what that means. Uh, a big open problem is to do the Coulomb case, which is really the relevant equation of Vlasov Poisson, you know, deriving Vlasov Poisson rigorously. Uh, it's, it's considered an important open problem. It's, and it's very relevant for astrophysics, plasma physics. Uh, so it's a problem people care about, uh, seriously. But that remains open. Huh? I'll, I'll show you some partial results. And then people had also played with uh, modifying the kernel a little bit, you know, truncating the singularity at a scale which depends on n, cutting it off. So there are some results, but of course it's still uh, partial because uh, that's not the true interaction. Okay, so the modulated energy method which I introduced and I want to describe um, to you here is quite simple in spirit. It consists in using a metric again, but which is based on the interaction itself. So it's a Coulomb metric if it's the Coulomb case, or it's a RIS metric. And you just want to take this norm of mu minus nu, so the distance between mu and nu squared will be the double integral of w x minus y, mu minus nu of x, mu minus nu of y. So just the total interaction of the system form of the of the density mu as a positive density and the density mu as a negative density. Of course, if you're in a Coulomb or Ries case, you can easily recognize that this is also a negative Sobolev norm. So uh, there's nothing um, uh, so new about this uh, metric. Uh, you can view it in Fourier, for instance. Okay, but it works well because the structure of the equation and the structure of the metric are adapted to each other. And you can prove this weak norm uniqueness property for the solutions to the limiting equation, which is the first step. You, you'd better have this if you want to hope to prove any convergence result. You better have that at least two solutions of the limiting uh, equations are, are uh, in, in controlled distance to each other uh, for a fixed time. So you can prove a ground val relation and you prove this. So this distance gets controlled in time by exponential ct times this distance. And what's important in this relation is that it only assumes a bound on one of the solutions. So one of the solution has to be a strong solution, has to be regular. And more precisely, what is assumed here is that the, the potential w controlled with mu2, so the potential generated by the distribution mu2 has two bounded derivatives. And that constant appears in this exponential. But the other solution does not need to be regular. And so as a result, you can hope to plug in here your empirical measure, which solves not quite the same equation, but something very similar. The only problem is that if you want to plug in the, the empirical measure, you have Dirac's. And you see immediately that this metric here does not really like Dirac's very much, because you plug a Dirac here and a Dirac there you get an infinity, so you have to, you have to renormalize it somehow. So the idea is to consider this as the modulated energy. If I give myself a configuration capital XN, which is a, an N tuple, <coughs> I want to here plug in the empirical measure, the empirical measure minus the expected limiting density, but I remove the diagonal in order to uh, remove these uh, infinite parts, right? So now you want to work with this guy and show that this thing satisfies a good ground value relation. And or, already you see a slight difficulty, which is that now this thing has lost its positivity, right? So, so the, the original quantity was clearly positive, but this one, once you remove the diagonal, it's not uh, clearly positive. However, it turns out that it's bounded below so it can take negative values, but it's bounded below and it has some good coercivity. So it does control a distance, not exactly this distance, but a weaker distance. So uh, the name modulated energy was 
chosen by analogy with the relative entropy and modulated entropy uh, methods that uh, were introduced over the years, in particular to take limits uh, from, uh, for example, kinetic to fluid equations and things like that. So each time you plug in some distance or entropy relative to the solution you're hoping to achieve at the limit. So this is in the same, uh, same spirit, I would say. Okay, so with this uh, idea, this is, a, this is a, the result. So the first uh, sentence is about this added force, if you want to add a smooth force in the gradient flow case. So this is how smooth it needs to be. So not very interesting. This is the V, uh, not very important. I think. And now uh, more, um, more important, you assume that your uh, limit solution, as I said, has some regularity. And the regularity that's assumed uh, here is that if S is less than D minus one, so you know, between Coulomb and D minus one, you want just uniform bound in space and time for some fixed uh, interval of time. And if uh, S is bigger than D minus one, you need a little bit more regularity. So you see here some holder regularity. I also talked about the fact I'm gonna ask two derivatives of the potential to be bounded. And if you have such a solution, so in other words, you know, if your initial data is good enough that the flow of that uh, initial data keeps the solution good, then you can have this convergence result. And the convergence is quantitative because you measure this uh, modulated energy, the size of this modulated energy in terms of the initial one times some exponential in time. And so, I, as I told you, this thing is coercive, and it shows you that if mu n not converges weakly to mu not, and if this limit, uh, if this uh, modulated energy is initially small, then it remains small for later times, and you have convergence of the empirical measures. Okay, so it's a sort of well prepared assumption. This stuff. All right, so you you get the convergence that you were hoping for on some interval of time, as long as you have good control on your limiting solution. So if you happen to know that your limiting solution lives for all time, then you have it for all time um, with, of course, an exponential factor. Okay, so this well-prepared assumption here is, uh, is implied by this uh, sort of no excess of energy, right? The, the initial energy divided by n squared converges to what you would expect. The regularity assumption that's made on mu t uh, doesn't require mu t to be continuous. So it needs to be bounded and the potential needs to have two derivatives that allows for patches. So a mu t that would be inter characteristic function of a set which is moving. And these are solutions which are interesting and in relatively important in, in fluids, for example, uh, vortex patch solutions to a large equation. Um, Another reason why it's important to allow for these is that in fact, these are the attractors of the dynamics, these, these in, uh, inflating patches. Uh, for, for the general risk interactions, even you can study what the, the sort of attractors of the dynamics are. They are these self-similar solutions that uh, take, take the form of some sort of inverted power, uh, positive part, and then you let, it, uh, you let it grow in a self-similar way. So the formula is here on the screen. They're called barren blood solutions. And if you happen to be in the Coulomb case, these things are uh, just in, dis become discontinuous and become indicator function of a ball. Okay, so remember all the particles repel each other. So you start from a patch. Uh, eventually what, what it does is it just spreads the, due to the repulsion between the particles. So it spread at a certain speed. All right, so after this uh, result was proved, now there's been some significant improvement by um, Mathieu Rosenzweig, who's a, a recent PhD um, from Austin. He saw that you could actually dispense with some of the uh, regularity assumptions. So uh, he was able to prove the result for just bounded initial data. And if it's in 2D log case, then it works for, um, for all time. 
And if it's a higher dimension, like 3D, you can only get it for a short time, but uh, at least get getting rid of this regularity or something. That's in the Coulomb case, not all risk cases. Okay, now about the limiting equation, it's called uh, sometimes the fractional porous medium equation. There's been some literature on these types of equations. Uh, and so in particular, the question we want to ask here is if you start from a good initial data, is it is the solution going to remain smooth enough? And the answer is below D minus one, yes. So if there's a sort of threshold at D minus one uh, power, but above D minus one, uh, it's not clear. It's an open question. So the, the, the theorem could be empty uh, above D minus one, right? If you can't exhibit such a good solution. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, I, I want to understand. So th these are these comments relate to your assumption, right, about the regularity of, of um, uh, on the previous uh, trans uh, previous slide. Yes. Yeah, the new T's. Yes. Yeah. So so uh, so under what conditions is this established? I didn't quite understand uh, the conditions for this. Th these are crucial, of course, right? So these, these are. These are Yes, so what I'm saying is that in the end, you can replace all the, all my conditions by a condition on the initial data. Oh, that's all you need? Yes, because then the PDEists have studied this, in these, the well posedness of, of, uh, of these equations, and they have proved that if the initial data is smooth enough, then uh, the solutions will remain smooth enough. And so then you can borrow their theorem and plug it together with this to say it's only a condition on the initial data. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah, thank you. But only when S is less than D minus one. So okay. when S is bigger than D minus one, the needed results are not available in the literature. So I cannot tell uh, you. That's why I was saying theorem could be empty because maybe uh, yeah, it does yeah. not so, admit a solution such that. Well. So the Coulomb case is still open or not? No, no, Coulomb case is fine. D minus okay. one. D minus yeah, one okay. is, is, way is way more singular than Coulomb. So D yeah. minus two is completely fine. There is global in time, uh, good solution. So Coulomb case works fine. Okay, thanks. All right. So now if you're interested in the case where you have noise, um, if you try to differentiate the modulated energy as I wrote here, doesn't work very well. And uh, Brez, Jabber, and Wang made a very nice uh, observation that you could actually combine the modulated energy approach and the relative entropy approach to build what they call a modulated free energy. And of course, from the point of view of a statistical physicist, this is completely natural. You should take the relative entropy multiplied by the temperature plus the energy, yeah? entropy plus energy. And so what is counted here when Fn is the density um, of on the configuration, you should compute the average uh, modulated energy. That's, my, that's the second term on the right-hand side here, the average modulated energy plus theta temperature times the relative entropy. And that makes the modulated free energy. And when you consider the case with noise, this thing has exactly the right structure. Uh, when you differentiate it in time, uh, what happens is that if you differentiate in time the modulated energy, you, you, you get some terms that are annoying. You can't control them in a bond value. On the other hand, if you differentiate in time the relative entropy, you also get terms that are annoying and that you can't control. And that's why the previous works of uh, Jabin and Wang was restricted to not to singular interactions because they were just differentiating in time the relative entropy. And they were getting terms that were too singular if the interaction was singular. And now the beauty of it is that uh, these bad terms on the two sides, they just cancel exactly when you put the right factor in front, which is the temperature. Uh, and then you can close the ground valve. It's purely algebraic computation. You can close the ground valve and you can finish with the same proof uh, that I was uh, using. And so if you put these two uh, ideas together, these two ingredients, you get the following theorem that if you add the uh, diffusion, you will convert to the same a uh, gradient flow uh, equation plus the, the diffusion uh, term. Okay, and then everything else is the same. You have your, uh, 
you have your modulated free energy, which is control, etc. So everything's quantitative, right? As I was uh, explaining here, you have explicit powers of inverse powers of n, etc. So um, it works. Uh, it works nicely. They were uh, then uh, able to extend the the, the method to uh, treating case with moderated attraction. So where you have a little bit of attractive part like logarithmic. And that allows them to solve the patla keller siegel derivation, which was something that they were after for a long time, I would say. But this works only in the dissipative case, this beautiful cancellation. It, it doesn't happen in the other cases. So, so the conservative case, if you have noise, is still open, like uh, the, the, the structure doesn't work well with noise. Okay, now, if you're interested in uh, Vlasov Poisson, the convergence um, to the, from Newton's law to the uh, kinetic formulation, uh, the kinetic equation, really, in Vlasov Poisson. So as I told you, the Coulomb case is a big open problem, but there is one partial result we can get with this method, which is we can treat the monokinetic case. Okay, so what is the monokinetic case? It's the case where your density um, in terms of uh, position and velocity is a Dirac mass in velocity. So in other words, at each position, you have a unique velocity uh, that's admissible. So it's, it's as if, you know, temperature was very small and instead of having a, a Gaussian in velocity, you, you restrict your Gaussian to a concentrated thing, uh, a, a Dirac really. Okay, and so this is the limiting equation that you expect when you're in this monokinetic case. It's called pressureless Euler Poisson. And so now uh, you have the, the density position velocity that's mu t of x times this Dirac, as I said, at uh, some velocity field u t of x. And that's, that's the system that you should get. Well, the method works in the same way. You write down a modulated energy and you need to add some form of modulated kinetic energy to it. And here is the kinetic energy. It's just the difference between the velocity, uh, the expected velocity field at the points xi and the true velocities at xi dx. Right, so you, you find this, you do your time derivative and you find that all the algebra works very well. And you can just plug in the same estimates from before. Uh, and so we got this result with Mitya Durant. If you solve Newton's law with initial data and you have the uh, modulated energy initially small, then the modulated energy remains small for later times. You have something quantitative and you have convergence of the empirical measures. And of course, also of the velocity profiles. Okay. So the difficulty is to extend this to non-Dirac uh, profiles of velocity. That doesn't work. Okay, so I want to give you an idea of the proof. And I will just give you one, one part of it, which is the weak strong uniqueness principle, because that's the core, <clears throat> just the basic idea. You want to say that if you have two solutions of the limiting equation, and one of them is smooth enough, then um, if they start close, they have to remain close. Right? And if you can prove that, you can hope to make it uh, work for empirical measures. So let's restrict further to the Coulomb case. So I told you about the potential generated by mu. So H mu will be the convolution of W and mu. So it's just the Coulomb potential generated by mu. Uh, it solves minus Laplace in H mu is a constant times mu. Uh, and I'm going to also restrict to the talk about the gradient flow case, but you will see that if you were in a conservative case, it, it would be just the same, slightly modified. So there's nothing special about the gradient flow here. Uh, but okay, so let's, uh, let's look at the modulated energy that I wanted to define, right? It's W X minus Y, W of X, mu of Y. So actually I should plug for mu, mu minus mu, mu minus mu, but, all right? So uh, this would be the potential H mu integrated against D mu. And then if I use that 
H mu is the fundament, you know, is the is solving this Poisson equation. I can replace this by H mu Laplace and H mu. Uh, and then I can integrate by parts, replace this by the Dirichlet energy of H mu up to uh, constant. So this works because uh, here I'm going to effectively assume that mu is the difference between two probability densities. So it's of integral zero. And so this H mu decays sufficiently fast at infinity so that you don't have boundary terms at infinity in this integration by parts. And this whole thing is, is actually legal. There is no problem. Okay, so grad H mu squared is just another rewriting of our modulated NL. Now, uh, you might know this object, the stress energy tensor. Here I'm going to define it as a, with brackets uh, notation. We'll denote it like that. It's 2 di h mu dj h mu minus grad h mu squared delta ij, uh, the chronic curve symbol. So why, why is this uh, quantity interesting? Because, well, first of all, you see that point-wise, it's bounded by the energy density. Right? So point-wise, it's controlled by grad h squared. And the other thing about it is that if you compute the divergence of this tensor, uh, at least if things are smooth enough, you can apply the chain rule and you get two Laplacian H mu gradient H mu. But that's the same as up to a constant mu gradient H mu. Okay, so this quantity mu grad H mu is a quantity that we see a lot appearing because it's the potential, the gradient of the potential multiplied by the measure. And if you go back to our equations, well, here it comes. You see the gradient of the potential multiplied by the measure. And of course, if measures are not smooth, uh, this thing, this product doesn't make sense. So this actually can be used to give a weak meaning to this uh, equation or to this product. But anyway, so now that we've learned this, we take two solutions. We look at the two potentials that um, are generated by these two solutions. So call them H1 and H2. And we differentiate in time the directly energy grad H1 minus H2 squared. So that's an elementary computation uh, by integration by parts, the Green's formula, you get H1 minus H2 uh, times the uh, dt of Laplacian H1 minus H2, but that's dt mu1 minus mu2. Now you insert the PDE because you assume that Mu, uh, mu one and mu two solve your uh, limiting gradient flow equation. So this is where I use that. Now I assume I have the gradient flow. If you don't have the conservative equation, just do it as well and it will work till the end. So you get this divergence of blah, integrate by parts again, put the divergence in this part and you get grad well, H1 minus grad H2 times this difference of products. Okay, so now we're gonna regroup terms a little bit. So let's do as if here I had mu1 and mu1. So if I had mu1, mu1, I could just put this as a gradient h1 minus h2 squared mu1, but this comes with a minus sign. So since we're talking with probability densities, this has a sign. That's the dissipation. We're in the gradient flow case. So that's a very good thing. We have, a, we have something negative here. We can throw it out. And then I correct the fact that I replaced uh, mu2 by mu1 here by putting mu1 minus mu2 times this. And now I recognize that I have a structure of the form grad h times mu, grad h1 minus h2 times mu1 minus mu2. And so that's uh, from the previous uh, slide, you know, from this relation, that's the divergence of something, the divergence of the stress tensor associated to h1 minus h2. And so now I can integrate by parts the last time. And if uh, I assume that H2 has two derivatives bounded, I bound this in L infinity. I bound this thing just pointwise in L1. And now I remember that this stress tensor is just quadratic in grad H. So I can bound by explicitly two times this times that. Okay, so if uh, H2 is this uh, nice solution so that this is, this is bounded, I have uh, closed the Grandval uh, estimate uh, of dt of blah divided, uh, controlled by C times blah. Um, 
All right, so that's the idea for the, the first computation of the algebra, if you want, of it for the, for the Coulomb case in the gradient flow situation, but in the conservative situation, it works without much change. Now, if you are in this Ries case with S bigger than D minus two, and this should have been a D, uh, then you replace the uh, Laplace operator here. You, you replace it by a divergence form operator. So you, you write that, uh, you know, the Ries kernel is the fundamental solution, not to the Laplacian, but to a fractional Laplacian. But you can represent this fractional Laplacian as a divergence form operator in a space that's has one more dimension as a caffarelli sylvestre uh, type extension. And once you do that, everything works in the same way. So you just replace your Laplacian by your divergence form operator and you can do the same computation. So this is, uh, this is the thing. But now uh, the main difficulty is not really there, is in making this work when you have the, the Dirac's in the problem because uh, if, you, uh, if you insert the Dirac masses, you look at the discrete situation, instead of uh, encountering terms like that, you're going to encounter terms like this. So you have these uh, empirical measures here in the integrand, and you have this uh, singular kernel t of x minus t of y dot grad w of x minus y. So this has, if p is Lipschitz, right, and p is going to be related to your uh, limiting solution. In fact, what you need is p to be gradient of H mu t, the potential generated by your limiting solution. That's where we assume that that thing is Lipschitz. So if C is Lipschitz to fix ideas, this has the same, this has the same uh, level of uh, singularity at the origin or on the diagonal as the, as the W itself. It has the same type of, uh, uh, of singularity. So that's why it's plausible to think that this it's controlled by the modulated energy because the modulated energy is what you get when you replace this by W of X minus Y. It's plausible, but not obvious. Well, because you know this happens with cancellation. So you cannot just put absolute values for your thing. And you have to worry about removing this diagonal. Um, and so that's what, makes this uh, a little delicate to prove. So in fact, this thing, if you want, is a, is a functional inequality, right? It's a general thing. It's a general functional inequality that you have to prove. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the main, the, the main thing to do. So how is this proved? Well, um, by an idea of suitable truncations of the potential. So instead of using Dirac's, you want to use truncated or smeared Dirac's. Right? So Dirac's that are gonna be smeared at a certain scale, uh, but you want the, the smearing to be uh, disjoint. And the problem is you don't have any control on the distance between the points. You don't want to assume that your points are at a distance bounded below by something specific because you don't know what's going to happen during the dynamics. So you're gonna take a smearing radii that depend on the point. Maybe not the same for all the points. And you will just take them to be uh, essentially the minimal distance to the nearest neighbor, which can vary in time and, and everything. And then there is a monotonicity of the energy with respect to the truncation parameter. So with respect to this uh, smearing radius, uh, which allows to actually make the proof work. So, these two ideas have a have a truncation that depends on the on the points and on the configurations and the monotonicity property. With this uh, crucial proposition, you can make all the proofs that I described work. So the one with blas of Poisson, the, the one with conservative or dissipative. You can also treat the quantum Coulomb case uh, with this functional inequality. It was used by uh, François Gauss and Thierry Paul. And now currently we have a sort of different point of view on it that we're developing in, uh, with collaborators here that will allow to treat the sub Coulomb case in the same way, because after all here we're restricted to more singular uh, interactions, but what about less singular interactions? It should be easier, but uh, by, by sort of getting rid of this, uh, this proof of this functional inequality and proving it differently, seeing things as a commutator that's appearing uh, 
commutator structure appearing here and some more sort of harmonic, hard harmonic analysis, I would say. But still with the same modulated energy um, idea. All right, so do you have any questions on this? All right, so to, to vary a little bit, uh, I'll tell you how the story came about. Uh, the beginning of it was to, to study uh, limits of Ginzburg-Landau equations or time-dependent versions of the Ginzburg-Landau equations, more precisely a parabolic uh, version here, dTU equals Laplace in U. And the gross Pitaevsky version, well-known in physics, uh, it's a it's sort of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So here you, now we're only in 2D and U is complex value. So I'm writing the equations without gauge because that's not really the, the issue is not in the gauge. Uh, you, if you understand this, you can understand the case with it. All right, so these things have an associated energy still the just for all the energy as, as I told you, it's appearing in superconductivity, superfluidity, Bose-Einstein condensates, et cetera. And you have vortices, which are going to replace our points. Uh, modulus of U indicates the density of the superconductors in your, in your sample. So where it's close to zero, it's the normal phase. Where it's close to one, it's the superconducting phase. And the zeros, they can come with a degree, and these are called the vortices. Right? So epsilon will be actually uh, in the, the parameter epsilon here will be the characteristic size of the cores of the vortices. And that's what you want to send to zero. And the degree of the vortex, the circulation of the phase as you wind once around a point x naught is two pi times an integer. All right, so in the limit, epsilon goes to zero, vortices become points. And now you can, Imagine that for some reason there are n of them, and you can try to commute the limits, right? So as epsilon goes to zero, I have a discrete problem. Uh, as n goes to infinity, I've proven to you what the mean field limit is. But what happens as you let epsilon go to zero as you let n go to infinity? So if you're sort of taking a diagonal in your diagram, um, can you really let those two parameters go to zero and infinity together without uh, any constraint? And can you retrieve the same uh, type of limiting equation? So the answer is it's not so simple. So n epsilon will be my uh, number of vortices. For some reason, I will assume that in my initial data, I have this n epsilon vortices with n epsilon going to infinity. Okay, to describe the vortices, you should define the supercurrent, which is the inner product of IU with grad U. So it's like a current in fluids, if you want, and the vorticity is the curl of the supercurrent. A bit like in fluids too, but except this time it's quantized. Uh, mu epsilon, you can show as epsilon goes to zero, is very close to being a sum of Dirac masses at some points uh, multiplied by some integers di. Okay, so here di's are integers. Now, if you take mu epsilon, you divide by two pi n epsilon, you expect to converge to a measure, which now could be a signed measure, right? We have to deal with pluses or minuses, or if we're lucky, maybe a probability measure. So we consider that the initial distribution mu is positive uh, and we'll show that then the limiting thing remains positive. But if you start with initial situations where you, you can converge with something, the density that has plus and minus in it, then uh, it's quite difficult, at least in the dissipative case. That's completely open in the dissipative case, I would say. Okay, so what are the uh, equations you expect? Okay, so you have to rescale your, your equations in time in order to get an interesting uh, limit. So these are the proper rescalings. And in the gross pitaevsky case, uh, it's well known to, well, anyone knowing physics that you should converge to the earlier equation uh, from uh, doing the Madelung transform, right? You, you, you go from super fluid, which is a uh, quantum fluid to a uh, classical fluid this way. And this is the, the limit equation, just 2D incompressible Euler in vorticity form, where here H is the inverse Laplacian of mu. So I write it EV like Euler and vorticity form. 
And now for the parabolic version, um, the, the a formal derivation was proposed in the 90s by, uh, on the one hand, Schatzmann, Rubinstein, and Schatzmann, and on the other hand, Y9A. And the equation is, if mu has a sign, now you need a distinguished sign, is a sort of dissipative version of Euler, right? So you take your Euler equation, but you see here you rotate uh, the, the velocity field. Uh, so the bio savar law gets uh, rotated by pi over two, and now you get a dissipative equation, which has been studied uh, in its own right by a um, bunch of people. You can view it as a Wasserstein gradient flow if you want for the Coulomb interaction. Etc. Okay, so bottom line, if you have an initial data that's uh, nice, the solution will remain nice. But if it's not the case, then it's quite delicate. All right, so now what about deriving these equations uh, rigorously as epsilon and goes to zero and n goes to infinity? Well, it was first done for very dilute regimes. Uh, so when the number n epsilon didn't grow faster than log, log, log to the one quarter. So, you know, a number of horses that can get large, but very moderately. And of course, under some well preparedness conditions, which is also quite natural. And then in the gross Pitaevsky case, again, some dilute conditions. And I would say they sort of take the proof for fixed n. So when, when n is fixed and epsilon goes to zero, these lim limiting. Uh, Evolutions are now discrete uh, ODEs because you have a fixed number of points. And that had been derived some time before by uh, uh, particularly from Wallin, Gerard, and Sonner. Okay, so they took these proofs and they made them more quantitative. And by making them more quantitative, you can squeeze in a little bit of uh, juice and you can push your N a little bit, but not too far. Uh, essentially, the proof really uses the trajectories and, and without controlling the distance between the points or possible collisions, et cetera. It's, it's very hard to go beyond. But now uh, the modulated energy method allows to bypass all that. And uh, it exploits the regularity and stability of the limit solution. Uh, and, and, and now here is the modulated energy in its, uh, in its um, Dins Borlando form, if you want. So it's the same thing that I was describing to you before, uh, but it's uh, tailored to Gins Borlando. It looks just like the Gins Borlando energy, which was grad u squared plus one minus u squared squared, shouldn't be this parenthesis over two epsilon squared. Except that here I have squeezed in a minus i u n v. And V, what is V? It's the expected limiting velocity field. So the thing that I think that things are converging to. So uh, the supercurrents normalized by n epsilon uh, should converge to V, and the vorticity should converge to the curl of V up to constants. All right, so if you have any experience with uh, the gins bolando functional, and in particular its gauge version, Maybe you will appreciate the fact that this really looks like a Gins Borlando with gauge, except now the gauge is your limiting uh, velocity field. And, and that's a sort of inspiration for all the calculations that are done here. So now, when you differentiate this thing in time, uh, you use the Gins Borlando equation, the, the time dependent equations in your computations. The, the, the sort of model case that I showed you uh, with the stress tensor computation. Uh, in the in the discrete case, the algebra of this one is much much more complicated. But the beauty of it is that it works. Like all the terms that you don't want to see, in the end you don't see, and you only see quadratic terms. So you you, you only reveal terms that are controlled by the modulated energy itself. You don't want terms that would be linear because they would have to be controlled by the square root of the energy. Um, and so the stress tensor also appears in the computations, et cetera. And, and I would say that the, the gauge, the, the knowledge of the gauge model was very inspirational in devising exactly the quantities that you have to put in to make the algebra work. And in the end, it's all just algebra and, and plus some fine estimates as well. But, all right, so with this, I uh, proved the following results, the convergence 
of gross beta f ski to Euler. Uh, but not only Euler in vorticity form, full Euler in, as an equation on the velocity. So incompressible Euler in 2D, but it's uh, limited to a regime which, funnily, it's not dilute, it's an epsilon quite large. So much bigger than log epsilon. Log epsilon being related to the self-interaction cost of a vortex. Okay, so it works again if your solution, your limiting solution is sufficiently regular. So here are uniformly Lipschitz. Uh, and then you have convergence in some space of the supercurrents, and in particular, that implies convergence of the vorticity. And in the parabolic version, uh, you have convergence to some limiting equations which are for, uh, expressed as uh, equations on the velocity fields. So this is a sort of dissipative version of Euler. Uh, but you see there are two regimes, in fact. Uh, so, so the regime has to be sufficiently dilute up to log epsilon uh, number of vortices. When n epsilon is bigger than log epsilon, I don't know. I, I cannot prove. So you know this commutation of limits is not so easy. Uh, but log epsilon is a relevant regime. I think it's meaningful because uh, that's what happens when you're near the first critical field. You are precisely log epsilon vortices, etc. Well, that's for specialists. But... So if n epsilon is much smaller than log epsilon, this is the equation you get. You, you get a divergence-free vector field in the limit. But if n epsilon is proportional to log epsilon with a positive proportionality constant, you lose the divergence-free um, condition in the equation and you get another equation. And then you have convergence. So again, if you initially, uh, your modulated energy is small, blah, blah, blah. And if your initial uh, vorticity has a sign, uh, as I said, that's important, then you converge to um, V and your limiting vorticity will always have a sign. But what's funny is that if you take the curl of this equation, L2, you don't retrieve the predicted equation. So this predicted equation of Chapman, Rubinstein, Schatzman, A, is not always true. When, uh, when the number of points is sufficiently large, when you lose this divergence free uh, freeness, you, you also lose the equation, you get another equation. All right, so the long time existence of these uh, systems was proved by uh, Mitya Duranx. And so as a result, these these convergences are for all time, not only for finite interval of time. And then we also studied with, with him some variants of this where you have different pinning weights and uh, we derive all sorts of funny fluid equations from, uh, from the gins volando types models. Okay, so uh, it's time to, to finish. And so uh, these things I already told you, but you, you sort of get around the difficulties by using this modulated energy and you use insights from the gauge model. Uh, one of them is to think of V as being a spatial gauge vector and DV as a temporal gauge. And then your algebra really works nicely to recombine things and uh, close the ground value loop. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's how it is. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so let me, let me first ask a question. Is there anything uh, in dimension three and higher that you can do with this theory for, for, for Ginsburg Landau? OK, so if you want to really look at Ginsburg Landau, uh, in dimension three and higher, the vortices are lines, yeah, or curves. So um, the, the the mean field limit is uh, yeah, it's 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 much, it's quite delicate. So the gross Pitaevsky case we can do. This theorem works in three D. Ah, okay. I, I I missed actually that comment. Yeah, it's it's more it's written small there. It's same proof. And and by the way, this is this thing is a three page proof, it's, it's extremely short. Um, but it, the, the main difficulty for me is this, that I have to assume n epsilon much bigger than log. When n epsilon is less than log, I really don't know how to do. Uh, but yeah, you can do 3D with that. 
And now if you wanted to do this, I think you would have to devise a different system. That would be much harder. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not inconceivable, but uh, I have to say that the tools that exist, uh, I don't think would be sufficient to do it really. The, the, uh, you know, to prove this, uh, I told you about this functional inequality, right? In, uh, in the discrete case, so now if you, if you have to prove that in the Ginzburg order case, it's much more complicated and it uses a technology that has taken years to develop and uh, in particular with uh, what we call product estimates that relate uh, derivatives in space and derivatives in time. So other functional inequalities that we devised for Ginzburg order. And yeah, in 3D, um, it's a bit out of reach for now. It doesn't, doesn't mean that it's not doable. So is it, uh, is it possible to understand this lower bound on an epsilon? I mean, is there some good reason for, 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 for why things are easier? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Okay, so when epsilon is much bigger than log epsilon, the vortex energy becomes negligible compared to the phase energy. You know? like, so you have, a, you have the energy of the cores and then you have the energy of the sort of global phase and, and that and global energy dominates. And so you sort of can, can neglect the vortex energy the vortex energy would be n times log epsilon, whereas the phase energy would be n squared. So if you can neglect the vortex energy, it simplifies your life a lot. So it's almost as if uh, in the original problem, it's almost as if you didn't have to worry about removing the diagonal. You know, because the what if you remove it or not, it's a it's a negligible uh, change. Everything is carried outside the diagonal. So does that mean the short distance is really not relevant for the time scales you're looking at, or what does that mean? It's it's just it just means that. It's not the time scale so much as the number of vortices. The if 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 the thing is very densely packed, yeah, the self interaction is uh is not is negligible compared to the global interactions of all the points because you have endpoints, so interaction is like n square, right? Yeah, because you have n square pairs, but each point carries on its own and log epsilon. And so log epsilon becomes n log epsilon becomes negligible compared to n squared. Uh, and so it's like it's as if you were saying it's it's the sort of global phase, the limiting phase is carrying the most energy, and the little oscillations of the phase created by the vortices are negligible. So in this case, you have it's like you have a strong convergence instead of a weak convergence. Right? Things are converging strongly, in fact. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, mm -hmm. when you're in the regime where you have these vortices, you can view them as little oscillations of the phase, and and so the convergences are only weak. And so this this that's why this is an easier regime, in fact. Yes. Because of the way you normalize, right? When you normalize by something so big, you sort of erase a lot of the fine structure. You normalize by n, and n is very big now. So maybe I could ask you something which is uh, probably not related to this uh, directly because it just involves a few a few vortices, right? Uh, where you put initial conditions uh, where you only have a few vortices, mm -hmm. and then you ask for a very long time behavior. Uh, and I, I, if I remember right, there's some work of of Chinikov who who uh, shows that they start of start to to move around each other and then but they get farther and farther away at some some time scale. Do you know about that stuff? Yeah, I think I've heard of these things. That's so a longer so time scale, I think you're yeah. in your so it's the, it's the, Of course, it's the uh, conservative case. And it's, yes. uh, it's like in the point vortex system, right? If you have a yes, and a minus, so. they, yeah. they turn around each other. But there's some radiation that, or something that goes on, which, which makes the, the vortices separate and, and rotate around each other. I, I thought it was interesting, but I, I yes. never so, followed up on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
I know what this is related to. It's related to the fact that um, a lot of these theorems require a well-prepared assumption. You know, I told you like if the initial yes. data is well-prepared. Okay, but what happens if it's not well-prepared? Well, if it's not well-prepared, it means that in addition to having your vortex and its phase, you know, this sort of EI theta that has to be there, uh, you have a sort of additional phase which doesn't carry topology, but still carries energy. Right? You could mm -hmm. add smooth, smooth, you multiply by a smooth EI phi. Well, yeah. phi doesn't see any vortex, but it carries, it still carries some energy. Well, it can happen that the vortices and that phase interact. So if you want the, the, the effect of that excess phase that you put in the initial data will actually influence the dynamics. Yes, that makes sense, of course. Yeah. And so that I, that's the phenomenon that they um, uncovered. And that was then rigorously um, studied by uh, Bituel, Smets, Orlandi, maybe Girard, I don't remember. And they actually proved that which effect the phase can have on, on, um, on basically creating an additional force on the vortices. I see. Yeah. Which is additional to the interaction between the vortices themselves. Right, right. The vortices it's in the back, interact some, yeah. as if you had background. A, exactly yeah. a background force. Yeah. Uh, and so studying the case where uh, that the energy is not well prepared is uh, is actually significantly harder, and that has been done only when the number of vortices is is, is bounded. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, well, who did you say was doing this work? Um, Petuel, uh, Orlandi, and Smets. Mm -hmm. I can send you the reference. To yeah, the, thanks. Yeah. Um, they did that in uh, the 2000s and they exhibited the uh, you know, proved it in some reasonable setup. Um, yeah, so these. These things are subtle, and, and also the, this example where I showed you that you don't converge to the equation that was predicted is a bit of the same fe feature. It's, it's a bit of the same phenomenon. Is that you can't just think of the vortices; you also have to think of the full um, current, or if you want, the full phase, because that also um, can move the system. Okay. Thanks. Any other question? Well, it does not seem to be the case. So thank you, Sylvia, for the wonderful lecture. Thank you for the invitation.